So you want to make money out of mathematics? Well, there is a way. You could invent some kind of algorithm that will help you find which stocks is a good stock to buy and then make loads by buying that certain stock. Okay, maybe that's not the way you want to go. So today I'll tell you how you could make a million dollars out of mathematics. Really, a million dollars. If you haven't guessed already, they are the Millennium Prize Problems. The Millennium Prize Problems is a set of seven questions, seven massive unanswered questions in mathematics that were set out by the Clay Maths Institute in the year 2000. And throughout time, these seven problems remained unanswered. So the Clay Maths Institute listed out these seven math problems from different areas of maths, and the Institute will give anyone who can come up with a solution a million dollars. So if you can solve any of these seven problems, you'll get a million dollars. Now, these seven problems are not easy, all right? Out of all the seven, only one of them has already been solved. That's how difficult it is. But you probably want to know what the question's all even about. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. So I'm gonna be explaining you the seven millennial Prize problems. Now, the Yangs Mills theory is concerned with the behaviors of elementary particles, such as quarks and muons and all those elementary particles. They talk about strong nuclear forces, which obviously acts at short distances, and they also talk about electromagnetic forces, which acts at much greater ranges. So for the problem Yang's Mills existence and mass gap problem, for a million dollars, you have to propose an improved Yang's Mills theory, which will fit with the Whiteman axiom, which is four kind of big facts, big rules in the quantum field theory. And not just that, from your improved Yang's Mills theory, you also have to show that there exists a mass gap. The mass gap is the gap between the lowest energy state possible, which is a vacuum with zero energy, and the next lowest energy state, which could be whatever, we don't know. And obviously we know that energy is equivalent to mass. It's related to the equation e equals mc squared. So whatever that space of energy difference between the lowest and next lowest energy will just be equivalent to the mass gap. Now the Riemann zeta function is the following function, as you can see here. It's an infinite sum. It's 1 over 1 to the power of s plus 1 over 2 to the power of s plus 1 over 3 to the power of s, so on and so on, where s can be any number at all, even a complex number. Now, the zero of the Riemann zeta function is some number s. Well, if you plug s into the function, into the Riemann zeta function, it'll give out an answer of zero. Now mathematicians have found that all the negative even integers, so minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, etc, are all zeros to the Riemann zeta function. If you plug all these negative even integers into the function, it will give out an answer of zero. Now mathematicians have also found that all the other zeros to the Riemann zeta function will have a real part between zero and one. That means if they're a complex number, the real bit of a complex number will be a number between zero and one, whatever the imaginary bit is. If you were, so if you were to represent these possible zeros on a complex plane, it would be along this strip. This strip contains all of the numbers whose real bit is between zero and one. However, mathematicians think that all the other zeros left will have a real part of a half. It won't just be anywhere along the strip, it will be along a certain line whose real part is a half. But this is not proven. So the Riemann hypothesis, for a million dollar, you either have to prove that all the rest of the zeros will have a real part of a half, basically all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function will lie along this vertical line in the complex plane, or find an example of a number, of a complex number, which is a zero to the Riemann zeta function. If you plug that number in to the Riemann zeta function, it will give out zero, 
which does not lie on this line. P stands for polynomial time. I have some problem was said to be in P. That means the time that you need to solve that certain problem will be some polynomial function of the size of the input. Now for the basic explanation, I would say you don't actually need to worry about that. All you need to know is that P problems are easy to solve, are quite quick to solve, like arithmetic problems. You know, like when you multiply, when you type it into a computer, it's very easy to solve. It's almost like that to solve it. Now, NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, which means that it might take long to solve the problems, but when to verify the problem, you will take polynomial time. Or in basic language that you and I would understand, NP problems are problems which might take long to solve, but takes short time to verify. So problems in NP consist of stuff like puzzles. Say a Sudoku. Um, if I were to give you a blank Sudoku to solve, it would take you quite some time. But if I were to give you a finished Sudoku and told you to verify whether that answer is valid, it would take you quite a short time. You can just look at the rows, make sure none of them match. Look at the columns, make sure none of them match. Look at the squares, make sure none of them match. And then you can just look at it and say, boom, this solution is correct. It takes you really short time to verify, but it takes you a longer time to solve. Now, if you think about it, problems in P, which are quick to solve, would also be quick to verify, because to verify, you can just go through solving process again. And that would take quite a short time, because it takes a short time to solve. So that means all the problems are in P, are also in NP. So any problems in P, if you draw a Venn diagram, would be a subset of NP. Now, as computer scientists went on and on with their discoveries, they found that many problems that used to cl classify as NP used to classify as hard to solve but easy to check were in fact also P. So they're all also quite easy to solve, they just never found it. And so that raised the point that maybe all the problems that we used to classify as NP were in fact P. Maybe all the problems that we used to say was easy to check were also easy to solve, we just never found how to solve it. So for a million dollars, does P equal to NP? Does all the problems that are quick to check, like Sudoku puzzles, in fact also quick to solve? Now, Navier-Stokes equation is a really important concept for fluid mechanics. You can think of it as Newton's second law equivalent, but not for rigid objects, like a ball, but instead for something like a fluid. Should I just spill water all over the floor? Hold on. Because fluids, which flows, does not behave in the same way as a solid. If I were to punch someone, which is a solid, they would just move as a whole. But if I were to do the same in a fluid, some of the molecules would move forward, some of them would go back, some would just scatter around the place, some of them wouldn't move. However, there is a big problem with Navier-Stokes equation is that we don't fully understand it. We don't know whether a solution for the equation will always exist. That's the existence problem. And even if the solution does exist, we don't know whether we can have an answer which does not have anything that's undefined or any numbers that's t going towards infinity. Because that's one thing about the equation we're doing in fluid mechanics right now. It will always have numbers that tend towards infinity and you just have to kind of work around it. This is the smoothness problem. So for a million dollars, you can either show that the Navier-Stokes equation will always produce an answer that doesn't tend towards infinity or a smooth answer. Or you can show a case of Navier-Stokes equations involving fluid where the solution of the equation will not exist. Now imagine a projective manifold. The manifold is just some shapes whose surface will represent some Euclidean space. When you look at it closely enough, say you're on the Earth, and then you're just a little man standing on the Earth. And if you look away in all directions, it just looks like a plane. It looks like Euclidean space. Now, the fact that it's projective means that there is going to be a point on that kind of plane, imaginary plane, that is infinitely far away. 
Now, say on that given manifold, you draw in a loop. You draw in some random loop. For a million dollars, can you show whether that loop that you just draw onto your manifold can be stretched and changed in a certain way that it becomes an algebraic cycle, or basically a cycle or loop that can be described in terms of algebraic equations. Now elliptical curves are curves that follows the format of y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b can be any number. Now if you were to plot this curve on a Cartesian plane, it will look a bit like this. Now on the curve there will be rational points. Rational points are points whose x and y coordinates are rational numbers, or numbers which can be expressed in terms of a nice fraction. Now, for example, this point is a rational point because both x and y are rational numbers, but something like this point isn't because, as you can see, here's a square root, and anything with a square root with a repeating decimal will not be a rational number, so this is not a rational point. Now, for the million dollar, you have to show whether an elliptical curve will have finite or infinite number of rational points. Now imagine a 3D sphere which if you can stand on, on the sphere, if you're small enough and stand on the sphere, it would look like a 2D surface. So for topologists, they would also call these two spheres, which are 3D spheres, which makes it really confusing, but whatever. Now say you have your two sphere or your 3D sphere and you drew a circle onto that sphere. Now if you were to contract that circle down, you would be able to contract it down into a single point. Now mathematician starts to think, if you can do this with a three-dimensional sphere, can you do with this with a four-dimensional sphere or a five-dimensional sphere or six-dimensional sphere and so on and so on and so on. Mathematicians found solutions for this similar problems for spheres in five dimensions or six dimensions, but they weren't able to find whether you could do this, whether you could draw, draw a loop on a 4D sphere or a 3 sphere as they like to call it, and eventually contract it all down into a single point. So four million dollars, can any circle, can any loop drawn on a four dimensional sphere or a three sphere be contracted down into a single point? Now if you happen to know the answer to this question, then I'm really sorry because someone has actually solved it before you and claimed the prize for this problem. The solution to the problem was proposed by a Russian mathematician called Grigory Herelman. He presented this proof in 2003 and it was checked and confirmed to be correct in 2006, which was the same year that he was awarded the Fields Medal, which is basically the math equivalent of the Nobel Prize, which he declined. And in 2010, Clay Maths Institute awarded him the million dollars for solving the problem, which he again refused to accept. And yeah guys, thank you very much for watching my video on the Millennium Prize problems. Apologies for any problems that I might not describe as well as I should or went into as much detail as you might want because I just kind of want to skim through it. And yeah, I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.